Hare Krishna. <laughs> Welcome to Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Also known as uh, Yasumati Nanda. Kadeya? Kana? Kana? Yasumati Nanda Raja Bada
facilitates the goal of life. And what is the goal of life? Premo uh, Pumarta, Mahan. What is that goal of life? Is to develop one's lo loving relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And to do that, there are so many principles on how to live one's life in such a way that everything points to that goal in life. In other words, the Vedic culture is the natural culture, the human culture, the culture designed by the Supreme Lord Himself for the facilitation of the purpose of life, and that is Taktwa de Hom Porna Janmani Naiti Mameti Surajana, to go back home, back to Godhead. <laughs> Not to make a nice arrangement in this material world to stay here and try to enjoy one's senses but to think about how I can again regain my position in the spiritual realm with Krishna and loving devotional service, which is intrinsic, or you might say natural, to the living entity's existence. And that can only be done by following the Vedic scheme. So the Vedas, Krishna speaks about the Vedas in the Bhagavad Gita, he says, Vedas is a home, a home, eva, vedyo, 
The Vedanta Krit Veda Ved Eva Chaham. He said, I am the compiler of the Vedas. I know the Vedas. And the Vedas are meant to know me. The goal of the Vedas is devotion to me. So Krishna, he established the Vedas. He knows how the Vedas work. And ultimately that same Vedas is meant to know Krishna or develop one's relationship with Krishna in devotion. So this is the actual intention of the Supreme Lord, which is the natural plan of the, uh, of the activities of the conditioned souls in the material world to raise them to this spiritual platform. So Veda means, uh, Veda means knowledge. All knowledge is contained within the Vedas. Uh, the Vedas have unlimited, and we can't even speak about how many books are in the Vedas. If we were to try to accumulate and count all the, Ved the all of the knowledge in the books, it would take it would take warehouses full of books just to stack some of the basic principles. The Vedas are so vast, but so intricately designed in such a way that if the living entity follows the Vedic scheme and gradually they will attain happiness in this life and ultimately the uh, perfection of life to go back home, back to Godhead. So sometimes we call it Vedic culture. Culture means the mood by which one lives according to a certain direction of life that brings about ecstatic moral and religious principles. What we have today is a... Uh, is a corruption of the real culture, and that is called Western civilization. The word civilization is somewhat of a misnomer because civilization means civilized. <laughs> but according to the today's standards for living, that word doesn't apply. It's more like animal civilization. So therefore, what has replaced the Vedic culture, at least to a large degree, is now something which is a deformed form of living, and that is called Western culture, where everything is based on money and enjoying the senses as much as possible. Even the religion today, at least many of the major religions, focus on giving people the greatest opportunity to enjoy their senses in the name of worshiping God. <laughs> which is completely different than the Vedic culture. The essence of the Vedic culture in terms of the knowledge given is Srimad Bhagavatam. And Bhagavatam is an expansion of Krishna when he left the planet. But Bhagavatam is non-different than Krishna. In the very beginning of Bhagavatam, Bhagavatam actually explains its essence in relationship to all other religious practice. And there's one verse, which is the second verse, Dharma projito kaitavo paramar nimatsarana satam. Dharma means, in this case, religious principles. Dharma projito, projito means to kick out or to get rid of, and kaitava means cheating. So, Dharma or Srimad Bhagavatam is actually Sanatan Dharma or eternal Dharma which kicks out all other forms of cheating religions, which, which mixes in all material desires with the worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is actually a good standard compared to today's society, whereas religion is sin seen as simply an, an obstacle to one's happiness in material life. So we are surrounded by that type of what we say misculture, when Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, the famous philanthropist, and also, also he was known as a spirituality, a spiritual person among the politicians, and the politicians among the spiritual persons. Gandhi said many very wise statements, and one statement he responded to was, when someone asked, what do you think of Western culture? He said, I think it's a good idea. What he was saying is there, there should be some culture there, but there isn't. So cars, money, sense gratification, and varieties of entertainment, and living according to a standard where one has to work like an ass 
simply to, to get their basic principles of food and medicine when needed and clothing is not anywhere near human culture. Prabhupada used to say that, um, I just forgot what I was going to say. Prabhupada was, oh yeah, that the basic needs of the human being, such as food, education, and medical treatment, or when we say medical care, was never um, a commodity for the commercial markets in the Vedic culture. It was given freely. By those who had that talent, the Brahmins, Vedic culture is Brahminical culture. Brahminical culture centered around teaching people the goal of life, giving them understanding of how to live life according to astrological predictions, and at the same time giving uh, advice on how to take care of one's health and also administering medicine. Many of the Brahmins were Kavi, Kavirajas, or actually doctors themselves. So this was never a commodity for a commercial market. It was done freely because it's a need of the human being. A need is something that should not be marketed. A need is something that should be supplied by the greater society. But here we have the so-called Western culture where everything is put under the economic category simply to make money based on what we need to live on. And therefore people are exploited. So there could be no limit on how much you have to pay just to get food, medical care, and that means you have to work hard in order to do that. In other words, you plug into an economic system in all aspects of your life, and it's not about human, spiritual, or even religious values. It's about how much material things you have and how much material things you can enjoy in this life. <clears throat> which is completely contrary to Vedic culture. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada came. He said, I came to make a revolution in this misdirected society of impious persons. He writes that in the very beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Seeing that Western society was in a misdirected direction, going towards economic development and sense gratification as a success indicator of how one is placed within life. And you see that even today. Who are the people who are given the most credit, the people who have the most money? <laughs> Doesn't matter about their character, has nothing to do with it. They could be the most debauched and even criminal character, but if they have money, they're considered to be important or popular. <laughs> For in Vedic culture, if a person had knowledge, that was considered to be uh, a, a, something that is held in high esteem. For instance, during the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and even before that, and as a standard for Vedic culture, in order to establish higher and higher principles of spiritual knowledge, because the Vedas are very vast, and the Vedas teach spirituality on different levels. Uh, they teach it for the very basic persons who are beginning and for those who are on the highest level of spiritual practice. So in order to establish what is superior in terms of the practice of transcendental knowledge and devotion, the, we found that one of the forms of entertainment, you could use the word in a loose way, was debates. <laughs> amongst highly intelligent persons who had understanding of Shastra. And if you didn't know Shastra and you couldn't quote Shastra, you couldn't enter into debate because you would have no foundation to what you would say. You had to support everything based on Vedic knowledge. And so, in those days, when people would debate amongst each other, the losers would automatically accept the winner and become his disciple. In other words, they would change because they heard something superior, something, uh, uh, let me say, closer to the absolute truth. So this went on, and therefore those who were quite good at that, who were both religious in practice and expert in knowledge, were considered to be highly esteemed within society. <laughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was also like that. 
he took up that process of debate to establish ultimately that Krishna was the Supreme Personality of Godhead. First he did it with basic logic and grammar, establishing the, the Sanskrit language with the, with the basic principles of grammar to establish a foundation for logic and argument. And after becoming expert in that, he started to put that all together and explain the superiority of worshipping Krishna as opposed to any other form of worship. And so this was this one went on, and this was entertainment for people in general. They would go and hear these debates on knowledge, and uh, and they would learn something, they would gain something, they would take it away, and they would also be able to improve their life based on this type of interaction, uh, based on higher principles. And. Uh, and those persons who were doing that, they were highly esteemed within society. In fact, we have the example of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was such a great scholar of the Vedas that although he had somewhat of an impersonal taint, he did one thing, that there was one particular scripture that was in Mithila, Mit which was, of course, the place of Janaka Rish many years ago. And they had this particular scripture that they would not allow anyone to have. You could go there and hear it, but you could not write it down, or you could not do anything to somehow or other copy it. But Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya had such a, what they call, Shruti Dara. So one of the qualities of great souls, and especially in the Vedic culture, is they had good memories. <laughs> Today, what is our memory? If I ask you what you do yesterday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you might have to think really hard. <laughs> or if I asked you what you did a year ago, you would think, uh, yeah. <laughs> so one of the qualities of this, this qualities of this age, that people's memories have become drastically reduced. And sometimes we can't even remember what we're going to say the next moment when we already planned on what to say. <laughs> that happens also. So memory has been most severely afflicted in this age. But Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, in order to, I forgot the name of that scripture, it just shows you how good my memory is. <laughs> but he went to Mathila to sit down and hear that scripture as it was given, and he memorized the whole thing. And then when he came back to Navadvip, he actually wrote the whole thing down. He memorized it. So, and then that scripture became available. Uh, but by his uh, Shruti Dara, Shruti Dara means one who remembers everything they've ever heard. Mm, in the most recent time, we had a person of that caliber, and that was Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master. He would sit, rather than go to the school, he was enrolled in a college, he wouldn't spend time in the classes. He would go into the libraries and read all the books. <laughs> and everything he ever read, he retained, and he could verbatim say anything back and upon any question asked to him about any subject matter. Prabhupada used to say, my spiritual master is a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> He had such vast knowledge, not only of spiritual knowledge, but even things in relationship to transcendental knowledge. So where do we find that today, is that one of the qualities of this age, because of sense gratification, because people are so much, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, so much, a bit, so much in front, uh, what's the word, uh, I can't think of that word, mm -hmm. so much privy to, that's, a, that's close to the word, in other words, so much, sense gratification is everywhere, <laughs> you know, so much, uh, huh? exposed. Hmm? Exposed. so much exposed, yes, good, that's the word, exposed to sense gratification, that 
as we imbibe such culture and also practice that in ourselves, our memories become dull. <laughs> and then we can't even remember, uh, you know, the basic things in life. And so, and of course, as sense gratification increases, memory also becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And this is one of the features of this age, that in this age of Kali, four things are drastically reduced. The first one is memory. The second one is duration of life. Uh, just like, for instance, in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's time, which is only about 535 years ago, 536 years ago, you know, Sri Advaita Charya lived to 100 and 147 years, and uh, what's his name? That uh, Gor not Gorky Shore does Babaji Maharaj, but Jagannath does Babaji Maharaj. He lived to 148 years old. So people would live 100, 120, 130 years. That was more natural in the beginning of Kali Yuga. But as Kali Yuga descends now, Prabhupada says the average age in India is 35 years old. That's in India, that was the calculation. That's due to many things besides memory loss. But this is the age of Kali. And therefore, this whole uh, lifestyle that we live in is very debilitating. Therefore, as devotees, we should be very enthusiastic to revive the principles that make up the Vedic culture. And that centers around devotion to Krishna. But then there are many other aspects to that, and that is the, the aspect of uh, food. One should only take food in the mode of goodness. Krishna explains that, that the mode of goodness brings happiness, health, and satisfaction, and longevity in life. And those foods are milk, uh, grains, legumes, fruits, and vegetables, like that. Uh, foods in the mode of passion are very hot, spicy, and cause uh, difficulty upon the body. Foods in the mode of ignorance are foods that are cooked through and not served out for three hours later, and usually it has an unmentionables mentioned in there. So they say you are what you eat. <laughs> so eating only Krishna prasadam and that food that can only be offered to Krishna, yajyasiso shanto munchate sarva kilbisa. Bunchite te yagam pavmam ye prachatma nakarana. That it says that that food taken that is not offered to the Lord, one gets sinful results from that. You get karmic reactions from that. But food as offered to Krishna makes the makes the mind and body clear and it becomes easier and more natural to practice the activities of devotional service. So eating is very important in our Krishna conscious life. I know we like certain things that are not offerable to Krishna. <laughs> so we should avoid that, such as onion, garlic, eggs, and other such unmentionable products. Foods that are very hot and spicy, that cause uh, pain to the body. Uh, and similar types of foods, foods that are uh, too much salty, too much sweet. These are also foods in the modes of passion, like that. So food is a very important part of keeping good consciousness in this age. But the most important part is to glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead as much as possible as the feature of our main activity in life. Glorification of the Lord brings about a culture of devotion where the devotees, when they come together, they center around glorifying the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Or the principles of devotional service that uh, uh, is in line with service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So um, material 
life or Western civilization, they call it civilization, is soul killing. It destroys all the good qualities of the living being, aesthetic, moral, and everything. We're polluting the atmosphere, we're polluting the food, we're polluting the water, we're polluting the consciousness. Everything is becoming polluted by the lifestyle we live. And people are working hard simply to get the basic needs of life, which are easily available by the arrangement of the Lord. So uh, one should think, therefore, Srila Prabhupada came to revive the whole Vedic schemes. He said, I want to make a revolution to again bring back a true religious principles and that lifestyle which is conducive to the worship of the Supreme Lord and aesthetic and moral values. And in, in that, there was three principles Prabhupada mentions, which are mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Brahminical culture, cow protection, and um, worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. These are the three main points that make up a wholesome human civilization, progressive human civilization especially Brahminical culture. Brahminical culture means doing things in the mode of goodness or being guided by higher knowledge come from the priestly class. Now we are guided by the, the economic class that simply guides our life accordingly. Therefore, Prabhupada wanted us to gradually extract ourselves from becoming dependent on this Western civilization and create the, a prototype of the Vedic civilization wherever devotees are together and gradually expand that to become the actual feature of this pro, a progressive civilization. So this is a big project and it will happen because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said it will, <laughs> but it's a gradual process. But what I'm trying to encourage today is that Western values are useless. There's no value in Western society. Just like, for instance, in the medical field. We read in Srimad Bhagavatam, what is the natural medicine that's given by the Lord himself for the care of the body, which is called Ayurveda. Ayurveda, Ayurveda, Ayurveda means long term. Long, longevity of life, that is the actual translation of Ayurveda. This is the natural me medicine given by the Supreme Person of Danvantari. Danvantari is an incarnation of a Vishnu manifestation that appeared during the churning of the milk ocean, which is mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the 8th canto, to show how one can live naturally and also treat the human body when there's need for treatment. We go to Western medical society and what do we get? We get an observation based on what they see, but they cannot understand what causes it. Ayurveda goes right to the point and uproots the cause of disease and reestablishes natural health. It's based on the natural constitution of the body, based on Kapapita Vayu, which are the three principles that make up the body's activities. And everything is based on that. Now, Ayurveda is starting to come back a little bit in Western society now through various inroads. But ultimately, it is the real medical. The Western medical, just like, a, for an instance, I was just talking to one of one devotee, he's from India, he's from Hyderabad. His mother was an Ayurvedic doctor. No, I'm sorry, his mother was an allopathic doctor in India. She was an allopathic doctor in India, but when the family got sick, she treated it in Ayurveda. <laughs> she made money by, by allopathic, but when she knew that when, when, there, when you really want to treat someone, you have to give it Ayurveda because... This is the actual medicine. But people don't go for Ayurveda. Why? Because it's more long-term. And it takes a discipline to follow the regimen of Ayurveda. Therefore, they go to the store, they give you some medicine. Here, take this pill, and you'll be all right, at least for a little while. 
It chases the disease from one place in the body into another place, or it relieves the symptoms, since, but it doesn't get to the room. Therefore, you see the hospitals are always filled with sick people. People are constantly sick, and most, a lot of people who die because of sickness die because of the treatment. And that's an, that's a, that's a fact. It says that 97 percent of people who come into the hospital die because of the treatment given in the hospital. Don't go to hospitals. <laughs> Stay out. <laughs> if you can avoid it, Prabhupada said, never bring me to a hospital. <laughs> when he was in the hospital in 1967, he, he had his third heart attack, so they took him to one hospital. And they start doing all kinds of experiments on Prabhupada. They were going to take a needle and put it into his head. Prabhupada said, get me out of here. <laughs> so. He stopped that particular procedure, he called the devotees and said, I want to get out of here. The hospital wouldn't release him. So Prabhupada arranged for one of his senior devotees to come with a wheelchair in the evening time, place him in the wheelchair and roll him out of the The nurses are running down the halls chasing him at the same time. Prabhupada said, just keep going. <laughs> he said, never bring me to a hospital. <laughs> So he understood what Western medicine is like, and Prabhupada talked a lot about Ayurveda. I mean, Western medicine is good for broken bones. <laughs> I mean, they can fix some broken bones, and they're also good for pathology, you know, they know a little bit about blood analysis. But as far as curing disease, forget it. <laughs> it's all experiments. So Ayurveda is the best because it is natural, it is given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself. So I'm using this Nanurveda means military art. Military was never used as aggression in Vedic society, it was used as a protection. That were the word Kshatriya, which is one of the Varnas, Shat means harm, and Triya means to protect from. So the word Shatriya means to protect from harm. So a person who was military, who had the military spirit or martial spirit, was a good fighter, trained, but he trained in the art of protection, not in aggression. Nowadays, the war is simply aggressive, and based on economic interests. If a particular country has something another country wants, they find out ways to get it. And then the various ways are, are various types of wars. So this is, uh, so we're living in a very dysfunctional society. I mean, it's completely dysfunctional. And it has nothing to do with the natural proclivities and the natural benefits that the human being can use. And the worst part of it is, it is it's pretty much atheistic. That anything related to God has no real meaning in life because it interferes with one's economic interests and one's economic development. So Prabhupada's program is very complete. He didn't just come to teach about relationship to the Supreme Lord. He said, I wanted to try and make a complete revolution of all aspects of society, political, social, medical, uh, ecological, architectural, you name it. It, Prabhupada spoke about it in Bhagavatam or in his lectures. So this is, uh, and when Prabhupada was in uh, Toronto, he spoke to a large group of people who were of the Indian origin there. And he was very strong. He was saying, you've come to the West, don't give up your culture. Your culture, it will save you from the horrors of this, this lifestyle of Western culture. He said, don't become brushta. <laughs> brushta means fallen. He said, keep your culture, and if you keep your culture and worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then you can be happy and free from the effects of this. And so in order to keep culture, we need community. We need community. So I'm speaking in, in this regard because community is the foundation for success in all aspects of life. What is that community? Uh, Vedic culture. Vedic culture means everything we do, we can do it together. Education, lifestyle, worship, 
medical needs, anything you need will be found within the community. So he said, establish these Krishna consciousness communities and gradually distance yourself from becoming dependent on this Western civilization, which can collapse at any, any moment. So uh, uh, I'm using this as an example to say that we have in front of us a very, what we say, valuable gift given by Srila Prabhupada. That is the Vedic culture, which is the real human culture. Veda means knowledge. Veda comes from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Vedic culture is human culture, and it, it is transcendental culture at the same time. So there's much to Vedic culture. We were talking today, I was talking today, even how women dress, how women part their hair, how people, uh, yeah, how people dress, part their hair, how they act, how they speak, everything is centered around glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, or a very basic principle of how to live in the mode of goodness, which is the mode of na the human qualities. The human qualities develop in the mode of goodness. So these are some points that I wanted to make in order to inspire devotees to start to think in terms of where are we going with this Western culture? And where, where can we actually go if we create community and society based on Prabhupada's principles? It, it takes vision because a, a, a vision without action is simply a dream. And a dream without a vision uh, or, a, or a, an action without a vision is simply a nightmare. Yeah, and with, without having a vision on how to do it, Prabhupada gave us the whole prototype. He spelled it all out, how to do it in his books, in his lectures, and in his society. Devotees are also understanding that in a practical sense. So, um, yeah, I'm just thinking in terms of how, where we should be going in that, in that direction according to how to live a Krishna conscious lifestyle, a free from the effects of this material lifestyle, and raise our children in the same way. And that is the mo one of the most important components of this whole lifestyle, is the future generation. And I'm seeing that a lot of the future generation of our devotees who go to schools in the Western civilization are becoming they're picking up a lot of the wrong things they learn in schools, such as bad language <laughs> uh, and various other types of things that go on as entertainment. In was, I was just a, I was in one of my uh, disciples' homes. She's a doctor in Pennsylvania, in America. She has two nice children. One, the boy's about fourteen. The girl's about nine or ten. So I was talking to the boy, what's it like going to school? He said, oh, it's horrible. <laughs> he said, there's always so many crimes and fighting in the school. They attack the teachers. He said, uh, and one of the things they do is they, they steal the sinks and the toilets from the bathrooms, you know. And the, the schools are just crime-ridden places. Of course, I think some of you have sent your children to private schools. That's a little bit better. <laughs> But these public schools are just, you know, as Bhakti Siddhant, I'm sorry, Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, modern education makes an ass of the living entity. What do you learn? How to get a good job. That's what you learn. And I was just talking to one boy today, and I said, well, what are you interested in? He was telling me what he was interested in. I said, yeah, that, that gets you a nice job. He said, yeah, that's what it's about, you know. <laughs> But that's not about human life. When we're not figuring how to get a nice job in this society. We're trying to raise our consciousness to the standard where we can find happiness in relationships and in everything we do in life. And that's based on higher values. 
not simply this called silpa vidya. Silpa vidya means that knowledge that teaches you how to do things, like uh, work on a computer. I, they asked Prabhupada, what is, what, is, uh, what is an engineer? Where does they fall into the Vedic culture? He said they're sutras. That's all. The sutra's an engineer. He can manipulate some kind of technological devices like that. But real knowledge is Brahma Vidya, or transcendental knowledge, knowledge of the self, knowledge of God, knowledge of a relationship with God, and knowledge how to live in this world in relationship to developing those other qualities of knowledge. Now this, this is Krishna. This is all there in Srila Prabhupada's pattern for so devotees are starting to wake up that we actually need this community in order for survival because Western civilization, as Srila Prabhupada says, has become more and more degraded. And you'll see, because when it's not based on values, culture, God, and what we say, eternal religious principles, it simply gravitates down to sense gratification. And sense gratification becomes more and more degraded as it goes on because it doesn't satisfy. The more one enjoys sense gratification, the more one will try to enjoy sense gratification as much as possible. And then it turns into something quite ugly and sinful and even very, what we say, destructive. That is the nature of sense gratification. It cannot satisfy the living being, but at the same time, those involved in sense gratification cannot give it up. It's almost like a man who is addicted to alcohol. He knows he's getting sick, he's wasting his money, he's uh, wasting his life by drinking, but he still can't stop. <laughs> so sense gratification is the same thing. And that people become addicted to it and it becomes more and more debilitating on a physical and mental level. And gradually it also becomes very much degrading. Where even good people, you'll see, just like in India now, some of the, the intervention of Western technology has really made an inroad into uh, India. Just like Prabhupada, which mentioned that uh, Islam was ruling India for 800 years and Britain for 200 years, but they couldn't change the Vedic culture. It remains strong, even despite these, uh, what we say, outside rule. And so, they tried everything to break the Vedic culture in India, but nothing could break it. So then they tried to introduce tractors to replace the cows, and to some degree they had that. But finally they figured out how to break the Vedic culture, and that was television. They did it. They intervened, they, they put television everywhere, films, Bollywood, all kinds of stuff. And now, you know, gradually people are looking, oh, this is what we've been missing, you know. <laughs> and so now they can, once they do that, they create a certain mentality that this type of lifestyle is, is, is something you should go for because it seems like you've been in poverty for so many generations and decades. Now here's where you can live high and you can get intoxication, you can have so many girlfriends, boyfriends, you can have fast cars and really sporty clothes, and, and this is what you're really looking for. What Prabhupada was saying when, when he was in New York, when he first came to America, he went to one technical school and he was giving a lecture, and one Indian boy was there. He said, Swamiji, what you're saying is very nice, but we need, now we need technology. Prabhupada said, you're a beggar. He said, I am not a beggar, I am a giving. You're coming here to beg, I came here to give. I came here to give, you know, how one can live eternally in relationship to the Suprema, which is the essence and the wealth of Vedic culture. It's a rich culture because it's Krishna's culture. It was established by the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the world, and at one time this whole planet was under Vedic culture. But now it's sort of receded to one area of the world known as India. And now that 
that, that rich culture is now being attacked again by the intervention of all of this sense gratification in the form of tech, technology and, and various types of entertainment. So we don't want to go in that direction. We want to keep our culture because what it is, it means that and just like the culture of taking p care of old people, in invaded culture, the old people were esteemed as people who were respectable, needed to have the care they needed until they left their body. They had, they were, they, they were, they went, people went to them for advice on different matters. A person who was senior or elder was a respected person in the family, in the society. Now, in the Western society, they see old people as a burden because they don't produce, they don't work. Therefore, they just sit around and uh, they just take up time, they fill up the old homes, they, they're always sick, and therefore, we don't really need so many old people, so let's have some euthanasia and get rid of some of the old people to make life much more easier for everybody. This is how they think. <laughs> So you see the difference between that Western culture, so-called culture, and Vedic culture. So I'm emphasizing this only for one reason, is build community and establish Krishna consciousness. But it takes community. You can't do it individually by nuclear families. It has to be done in a communal way. So I would suggest you all meet together and discuss how to do it as much as possible, because there is a practical way to do it. And once we start to do that, and you'll see, everything becomes more natural and easier. And still, there are, what we say, facilities in order to develop that culture within the environment. It hasn't been completely lost yet. <laughs> so this is uh, my humble suggestion, <laughs> based on what Prabhupada has given us in terms of the spiritual aspect and the practical living thing. Prabhupada talked about practical living, how to live practically, how to take care of your health, well, how to how to walk, how to talk, how to wash. <laughs> Prabhupada did, did everything. If you want any question you might ask, you can find the answer in something that Srila Prabhupada said. You may not find it all in his books, but he either gave it in his books or in his lectures or in his room conversations with his devotees or on his morning walks with his disciples. Prabhupada covered everything. <laughs> because he, wa he knew he was sent here to do this work to make a revolution against this demoniac civilization. And Prabhupada did a great job in the 11 years he did here. It was amazing what Srila Prabhupada did. Um, he was highly empowered by Krishna and he worked tirelessly to give us this knowledge, especially in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the foundation for everything we do in Krishna consciousness. So, thank you very much. I just wanted to make this point because I think it's very important that we think about our future and the future of our children which is also uh, very much dear to our hearts. Uh, and, of course, um, how to practice Krishna consciousness in a way that is unimpeded and uninterrupted by unnecessary necessities. Unnecessary necessities. Necessities that are not really necessities. That means working hard like an ass every day of the week, nine to five, that human life is not meant for that. Human life is a tato brahma jigyasa. And taking care of the body is very easy, but not in this society. <laughs> they make it a big chore the way it's organized. Anyway, thank you.